Hi, my name is Christopher Anatra. You know me as the Quantum Businessman. I'm sitting down with Shane Robinson yeah. from Unbiased and On the Fence. We're in Ketchum, Idaho at the 2019 Mandela Effect Conference. And uh, Shane, wow, last night your presentation was pretty amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was a real nerve-wracking first time ever getting up in front of a, a live crowd and doing a presentation, but I feel like it went okay. Yeah. yeah, I think for a lot of us, we're all kind of getting out of our, our comfort zones a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Even with myself coming forward and, you know, facing a lot of criticism and so forth, but it's, we both know it's what we're talking about is super, super important. Right. One of the things that I really liked about your presentation is how you started drawing, like, connections to things, like even that map that you had created. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was pretty outstanding and I thought it's gonna, it could be a way to provide clues as to how things are changing. But just to recap, um, tell the audience what you had discovered when you created that map with, with the word love in all the different languages around the planet. Yeah, so I used a guide map um, just so I would know how to set the letters up. I lined the letters up with all the continents. I zoomed way in. I had over three dozen languages of the, the, the top languages. And then I just put them right over the landmass, lined them up along the edge, and then I turned off that map layer that I used as a guide to create my own original artwork. What, what software did you use to create I that? used the Illustrator. Illustrator, okay. Yep, so they were vector, so I was able to zoom in 6,400 times the size. I could zoom way in on tiny little islands and things like that. And what I discovered when I heard that there had been map changes, I thought, hey, why don't I pull out that old file I got and see what it looks like? It had been on a hard drive that wasn't connected to the internet, so that let me know that a lot of people that thought, you know, AI was sort of making hacks right. just through the internet and changing things, it let me know that was impossible at that point because it wasn't on the internet. So okay. I stuck that file in, opened it up, I turned on that hidden layer with the map underneath and discovered it was not the way I left it. There were uh, discrepancies with what I set up to, to be lined up perfectly with the land. It no longer lined up perfectly everywhere. Now some of the bigger changes people see, like South America looking like it's moved way to the, uh, the east. Uh, I think uh, some people think uh, New Zealand and Australia were sort of placed differently. Those things uh, on the whole, so on the macro scale, it looked like my artwork had been changed, but when you zoom in, like along South America's uh, west side, right. uh, you can see where the land used to end, but now it's actually grown out. And uh, so you can see where my artwork ends, you can see where the map now extends beyond where it was. And uh, so yeah, it, was, it just blew my mind. You know, from what I'm, I'm gathering is that you're kind of a meticulous person because you, you do like the decals on cars and so forth. Exactly. To, tell us a little bit about what you do for that work. So yeah, I, uh, I used my graphic design experience and uh, I got a, a plotter, a vinyl plotter, and then I would do graphics on vehicles small ones, big ones, stripes down it, or down the whole side. I did a lot of that, that sort of stuff. But it was within that same uh, program, Adobe Illustrator. So uh, yeah, it's, I've always had a, a history within art. That's awesome. And you actually created this art for some kind of a competition? That's right, Adobe had a contest in 2011. So I spent almost all of 2010, I mean it took forever to, to cover this map and I'm so glad that I did it before it changed because yeah. there's like hundreds more islands. I, I don't, it would have taken me another year to do it with all the new islands that's popped up. You know what, it's something so any, like this, this what you did is I think going to start to inspire other people so that they can start to maybe figure out ways to track these Mandela effects. But what you did I think was brilliant and it's actually going to lead to some other things. So. I really hope so. And, yeah, and it was a, a great way to run into some other residue as well. Uh, one time I looked up uh, somebody that was doing a, a tutorial on how to create the Coca-Cola logo. You watch him create the whole Coca-Cola logo and he ignores the dash as if it wasn't there when he did it. Right. You know, so there's these ways you can go find this residue. It just doesn't make sense this guy doing a tutorial on how to create the Coca-Cola logo. Because I thought the dash was lower, but when I saw that, I'm like, well, maybe I, I remember it without a dash. I remember it with a weird wavy dash at one point. Right. Uh, there were some different uh, memories I had of the Coca-Cola logo, logo, but the, it being up at the top, you know, was definitely one that was new for me. Yeah, even when it comes to Coke, Coke Zero, right? It was always called Coke Zero, then it was always Coca-Cola Zero, and I think I might have seen Coke Zero come back again, so right. it, gets all, it gets all confusing. Yeah, and a lot of that, I, you know, before the Mandela effect, I just assumed it was, you know, marketing strategy changes or something, you know. Right, so with the flip-flops, we have to be cautious about 
um, bets at bars. <laughs> I want you to tell me a little about that. I thought that was like really interesting about the story about your brother. Yeah, my brother. So uh, I'd been trying to get him to see the Mandela effect. When I first showed him some stuff, you know, he was like, you know, nobody cares. We're just trying to work and pay our bills. He was really kind of hostile about it, you know. So I'd trickle something to him every now and then thinking, this would get him, you know. Well, he was way into wearing headbands and stuff in the 80s. And uh, he's nine years older than I am. So uh, one of the people... Uh, you know, that wore a headband, known for wearing a headband, was Richard Simmons. When yes. I found out he didn't wear a headband anymore, I'm like, oh my gosh. You can find these costumes, Richard Simmons costumes, they have the headband, but evidently he's never wore one at all. So I sent that to my brother, you know, and he, he hit me back, I don't know, 20 minutes later, I guess he Googled it or whatever. And he goes, man, there's got to be a, a way to use this to make money more than bar bets. You know, that was the first place he went to. And I said, well, you better be careful because you might make a bet. It might flip back to how it was and you lose your money, you know. Exactly. Because I had the same thing happen to me with the Flintstones. Yeah, I had something with uh, my girlfriend at the time. And she remembered it as Flynn Stones. And I remembered it as, no, it's Flint. And then, like, two weeks later, it switched back. So, yeah. You know, if we made a bet, she would have lost her money. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you never know. You have to be cautious about it. That was one that I saw that flip-flop was uh, crazy because I remember reading the Bible as a kid and hearing that they circumcised with flint knives. And I remember making that connection at that time and saying, oh, that's why they call it flint stones. And you know what I mean? When you have that memory node of yeah. when you figure out what a word is. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, oh, they made knives out of flint. So yeah. it was that realization of it being flint stones. And then uh, when I first discovered it was Flintstones, and then it flipped back. I think it's currently Flintstones against Gr It's back Gr to Flint. Like, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you like the stone you make fire with. That's exactly. How I, I always associated with that, like you're making a spark Absolutely, of fire. Absolutely, yeah. And Flynn just didn't seem to make no. sense. It's more of a regular name, but not, you know, of course, I mean, anybody that watches the cartoon, everything's named after a rock or a stone or something, yeah. Exactly. So all this Mandela Effect stuff is really interesting. And one of the things that it led me to is starting to investigate other things. Other things started coming out to me as far as spirituality when it comes to the Mandela effect. How has that affected your life as well? Because I know you've been pretty, you, you know, your whole life you've been pretty spiritual, the way I Yeah, I, I was heavy into Christianity growing up, read the Bible dozens of times, but I hadn't really read it in uh, a decade, so that allowed me to see some of the Mandela effect changes in the Bible. Actually, quite a few of them, dozens of them, I, I noticed. In fact, I can't barely read it without seeing something that I'm like, you know, yeah, it wasn't that way. I mean, exactly. It's just riddled with changes. Exactly. You know? So yeah, when I uh, this, I had sort of went to a left brain type of you know scientific, just moved out of metaphysics and spirituality. Um, just felt like you know I wanted to leave the world a better place than I found it. That sort of thing. Help people, love people. But I really didn't have much into religion or spirituality at the time when the Mandela effect hit me. But after investigating that and seeing I couldn't find a left brain analytical solution, right. you know, there's a few things people talked about, but I felt like they were dead ends. So I continued to search it out and I found that it sort of pushed me back into the supernatural, the, the spiritual or metaphysical. So then I started looking deeper at what it might be telling me because they seemed very purposeful. Like they didn't seem random, you know. Exactly. Has that like have there been any beliefs that you've come to like start to investigate more or take more seriously like things such as reincarnation how do you feel about that you know it's funny a lot of the things that uh, uh, the changes were telling me after the fact I'd sort of realized that like uh, you could find proof of reincarnation in the Bible uh, there were several instances like where the, the man was born blind and uh, they asked Jesus you know was he born blind because of his sin or it's the sins of his parents. Well, if he's born blind, then the only way that it could be something he's paying back karmically is that it, it was a previous life. So it's right there, you know. Right. And there's another time when Jesus goes up on the mountain they, and they say that uh, they didn't recognize that John the Baptist was Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Right. So th I saw these things and I realized that reincarnation is actually supported by the Bible. It's just not taught in doctrine. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's talk about different types of um, books of the Bible that actually were removed because at certain points in, in history mm -hmm. when they were trying to like edit the Bible and put it together for the official part of uh, Christianity, right. I believe the Nicene Council, mm -hmm. there was one of the books of the Bible that actually referred to reincarnation as one of Jesus' teachings, but because someone there felt that their slaves would like revolt by killing themselves because they knew they would just be born again. That right. they, you know, so they removed that part of it to keep people under control. 
Yeah. So all those things are really interesting and investigating them and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a, a lot of what it's, you know, the idea of the Bible being inerrant is like a 1900s, uh, you know, a development, if you will. This isn't something that they've always said since the Council of Nicaea when they, you know, canonized the works that they wanted as the Bible. Exactly. So I found out that's new. And then, you know, I'm looking at the King James Version. You see that the Ten Commandments are written on tables instead of tablets. Uh, you know, I think I found 12 or 13 instances where tablets is written tables. Well, inerrant means no typos, too, right? So I think it's, uh, I feel like these changes are, are revealing something to us. And that's why I think it's a good idea to take a deeper look at it. It's sort of like you can study the alarm clock and wonder why it's ringing, or you can look deeper and say, well, why is this waking me up? Right. So it's been a wake-up call for me in a big way. Yeah. Awesome. Even when it comes to the Bible and the book of Psalms, I was blown away by unicorns. Like, oh, yeah. tw at least referred to twice that I could find in the book of Psalms. Like unicorns in right. the Bible. Like, wow, mythical, mythical creatures yep. talked about in the Bible. So Yeah, it's amazing. And womb has been changed to matrix. I think a lot of these are yeah, telling right, us. Yeah, right, right. They're telling us something. You know? Exactly, exactly. So what advice would you give someone that's just starting to come into awareness of these Mandela effects? Well, it can freak you out at first, you know. I've seen some people get really fearful about it because, you know, it really it, it affects your whole paradigm. And it, it's a paradigm shift because with me, the things were impossible from how I saw reality. So it forced me to go back to the drawing board and say, well, evidently the way I thought things were is not the way it is. So that can disrupt people, especially if they have a strong worldview, you know, maybe a strong religious connection. Mm -hmm. You know, typically even, you know, Christianity, because the Bible itself is changing, and people think of the Bible as being unchanging, like it's God's Word and it's unchanging. So that could really uh, bother some people. They feel like it's uh, evil or something. But I would tell anybody first coming into it to, you know, just think optimistically about it, not to get too freaked out. Uh, once you get familiar with it, after a few months, it will, that, that initial shock will settle down and uh, you, you'll be able to accept it a lot better. So just not to freak out, know that you're not alone, know that you're not crazy. There's other people that are seeing these things happen. Exactly, exactly, that's really good advice. Thanks. Shane, it's been awesome talking to you and getting to know you. Absolutely. And yeah. all the other speakers, this is like really a special event. It and really as, is. as we hold more of these in the upcoming months and years, yeah, people are gonna wanna, I think like for myself when it first started happening, I was just like so hungry for information. Oh yeah. So, you know, anything that we can do to share and I think the main thing is, is what resonates with people. So mm -hmm. we could discover things and we could share them and it may not resonate with someone and that's fine. And sometimes we can even go off track a little bit. I know mm -hmm. I've done that myself, but we just help, we all help each other. Yeah. We're building a nice mm -hmm. community to do that. Yeah, it's good to remain open-minded open, open minded because even if something isn't the way it is, I mean, just to consider it is a good thing. It's consciousness expanding, you know? Yes. And I wanna thank you for coming out because being a CEO, I know you had a lot more on the line. You know, I'm just some guy in a flea market or whatever, so, but you know, you had a lot to lose and I appreciate your bravery with coming out, I really do. Thank you very much. No problem. Seems like I've known you for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's reincarnation involved. Right, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. man. But Shane, thank you very thank much. Thank you, buddy. All right. Have a good one. Take you.